Um, thank you very much, John, and thank you to um, the HVN team for inviting me here today to talk about uh, weaning foods. Um, just a brief overview, I'm really going to emphasise the uh, importance of the first few years of forever. So even though John has intimated that uh, young children are becoming obsolete, um, I'm going to emphasise the fact that actually young children grow into adults and older adults and actually optimising nutrition in the early years is really the thing that we need to be concentrating to ensure that they go on to have uh, healthy and uh, productive lives. I then uh, briefly also then want to talk about where I see some of the opportunities for research and development around uh, early life nutrition, but particularly during the weaning phase. And when we talk about early life nutrition these days, we really um, use the co or coin the term the first thousand days. And this takes the period from in utero through pregnancy, uh, the first year through to the second year, and that makes a thousand days. But it, the World Health Organization and also UNICEF are now actually talking about the first 2,000 days being the most important uh, time in our lives in terms of inf in informing uh, programming of development and health later in life. So why is it such an important time? Well, early life is a time of rapid growth. Um, the most rapid or rate of growth that we have is in utero and actually within the first six months of our life. Uh, within the first year of life, an infant will um, uh, uh, double, uh, uh, double their uh, weight, uh, double their weight, triple their weight, and double their length. Sorry, and within the first two years of life, 80% of our brain growth or brain development occurs. So by the age of five. 90% of our brain development has occurred. So you can see that nutrition is vitally important uh, in, this, uh, in these early years. And of great interest today really is the way that nutrition in these early years can impact on uh, our later life health. So the interface or the interaction of nutrition with our, our epigenetics really sets us up really on a trajectory of programming and how our our adult life basically turns out so whether we go on to continue having a healthy life or become more pre predisposed to certain diseases through exposure um, to an unhealthy diet. So you can now think about suing your parents, particularly your mother, if you haven't had a fruitful um, adult uh, life. We all know it's absolutely unprecedented that breastfeeding is the optimal source of nutrition uh, for an infant. So it really is the ultimate functional food. So if we're talking about high-value nutrition, breast milk is it. Um, breast milk contains optimal nutrients for growth and development of infant, but it also confers passive immunity because it has a wealth of immune factors in it and many other things that I could spend the whole 15 minutes three hours talking about. It also has incredible benefits for the mother as well. But obviously an infant can't be breastfed forever because an infant starts to develop uh, uh, feeding skills but also teeth. Uh, and at some stage it becomes ready to um, have solid foods introduced. And we call this the weaning period in New Zealand but I appreciate for people who have uh, from America in this audience, weaning also means weaning off the breast. So really we should be talking about the introduction of solid foods when we talk about weaning. Why introduce solid foods? Well, we introduce solid fi uh, foods in response to the development of feeding skills. So when an infant is born, it can, it can suck very well and it can swallow liquid. Uh, but as it, uh, its gut matures and its oral motor skills uh, mature, uh, an infant's gag reflex appears and it can start uh, you know, consuming foods or, or thicker liquids and then transition onto softer foods and more solid foods. And, and it's sort of feeding begets feeding. So if you don't intervene or you don't feed an infant uh, uh, solid foods from an appropriate age, then the ability ability to um, move on to solids and transi transition through that feeding period also becomes impaired. And we also know that it's very much linked to oral motor development and speech, speech and language. Um, we introduce solids too because we require the gut to mature so that when an infant is born they have an immature um, uh, gut. Uh, they have a low level of enzyme production, particularly from the pancreas. So it's quite important to start introducing solids to mature the gut and to develop uh, 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 pancreatic secretions. Uh, the introduction of uh, solids is also important for um, taste exposure, so for infants to get, start getting used to 
uh, uh, new foods and new tastes, just not, not, you know, depart from milk. But in saying that, breastfed infants do get some taste from specific foods and chemicals that the mother consumes through eating as well. And very importantly, too, we introduce solids into an infant's diet to um, get specific nutrients, particularly things like iron and zinc, which over time may not be optimal in breast milk. So there are, there are many reasons why we introduce solids. Now, in previous uh, uh, decades, uh, introduction of solids were very much linked with the, uh, the acquisition of developmental skills. So we used to recommend that infants were introduced to solids when they started putting things in their mouths or when they could hold, have good head control. And so we t tended to advise parents to look more for developmental cues around uh, introduction of solid foods. And then there was this time for progression from a, a thicker liquid to a, a, a puree to uh, soft lumps onto more solid foods and then finger foods. But today, our food and nutrition guidelines around the introduction of, of solids have changed, have changed, and they've really changed since the directive in 2001 from the World Health Organization, which recommended that we exclusively breastfeed babies, so exclusive means absolutely nothing but, but breast milk, for the first six months of life. And then thereafter, or around six months, start introducing solids into an infant's diet. So in New Zealand, for example, um, these uh, uh, recommendations were taken up by the Ministry of Health or recommended by the Ministry of Health in 2008. And since this time, we've had this transition where parents in the past, prior to 2008, were advised that infants could have foods introduced into their diet between four and six months of age, whereas now it's at around six months. And so we recommend that infants are, are introduced and progress quite quickly through the different types or transition through the different types of solids in, in, in not such a, a sort of systematic way. So they have to try and get everything kind of a variety, the texture uh, introduced in a quite, you know, a quite short period of time. And the other thing that's also changed that you can see in this um, slide, this wheel here, is that in the past, we all always advised that uh, some of the larger proteins or the foods that may cause allergy in infants, particularly things like egg and soy, and maybe in some families uh, where there was um, uh, seafood allergies, and particularly things like peanuts as well, these foods weren't introduced until after 12 months of age. So the notion there being that until the uh, immune system uh, became more mature, the infant couldn't actually tolerate some of these larger proteins. Now, the new recommendations that we have based on evidence around um, allergy is that we can introduce these foods now in quite quick succession at six months. So there is no delay to the introduction of, uh, uh, of foods that may cause allergy. Um, a lot of the, uh, it, it's what I find really interesting, there's, there's so much research around the um, uh, benefits of breastfeeding in early life, but there really is a real dearth of uh, a good research in infant feeding, uh, particularly around the introduction of solids, uh, the appropriate age for the introduction of solids, and also the types of uh, solids that should be introduced, particularly now that we've got that shorter window uh, to introduce solids. Most of the studies in this space have really been around micronutrient status. And certainly in New Zealand, this has been an area of research that I've been involved in and some of my colleagues um, at Otago University. And we found that in healthy uh, New Zealand uh, infants and toddlers, aged between six and 23 months of age, that we have actually quite high preference rates for iron deficiency anemia and iron deficiency. And again, th this age group is probably the highest, has one of the highest risks apart from uh, women who are in pregnancy of um, iron deficiency globally. And maybe much of the research is done on micronutrient deficiencies in this age group because it's an easier biomarker. It's something that's actually easier to, to look at with regards to finding evidence and doing something about it. So what I'm putting to HVN is that we have very little information on uh, appropriate weaning foods. And I think there's a, a huge research capability in this country to actually look a lot further and do research in this area, um, particularly around optimal growth and body composition, the continuation of the optimization of growth and body composition from breastfeeding, how we can continue that with appropriate weaning foods. 
uh, uh, looking at feeding development and the appropriateness of that, obviously uh, cognition and brain development, looking at optimising health through uh, better weaning foods, uh, ensuring appropriate taste, particularly around uh, appetite regulation and, and foods that uh, are nutrient dense but not high in energy, looking more at the uh, allergic response in this early age and providing protein tolerance through improved weaning foods. And we've heard a lot about the microbiome. I'm not sure what the optimal microbiome is in the older infant, but we sure know that the breastfed uh, microbiome optimizes health. So I think there's a huge opportunities for research and development in this area in New Zealand. And I urge HVN uh, to look at it. And I think a lot of the capability sits actually in this room. So in summary, nutrition in the first few years is forever. And I think weaning is a very significant opportunity for research and development in New Zealand. Thank you.